B-S-U-C-A-P. That's what you call yourselves, isn't it? Bazooka. <laughs> <laughs> I love these ones that laugh after everybody else stops. They're great. I want you all to listen up now because this is serious academic credentials. Our speaker tonight, David M. Salzman. I don't know why I wear these things. I got one of my own. I'll take that off and put it on here. Does anybody want to make a bid on this sucker? I'm starting at 25 cents. 45, we got 45, 45, 45, do I hear 50, 50, 50, 50? One dollar, 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 one Okay, back to the serious stuff. Now I'm going to tell you some credentials that we're really impressed with in Chicago. Our guest speaker tonight graduated from the University of Chicago. Which has the Fermi Labs. With a BA in 1953, he holds a master's degree from the University of Nebraska in Geography and Business. And he... <laughs> Just because you got a good football team, buddy, doesn't mean you can buddy on the show. And he holds a doctorate from the University of Chicago in Urban Economic Geography, which he earned in June of 1966, which was a hell of a year. <laughs> I think I'm going to have to get the quintet to warm up in the lobby. Okay, not only is this gentleman well qualified, but he's also seen fit to pass along his knowledge to younger generations. He has been on the teaching faculty at the University of Illinois Chicago Circle Campus since 1966 and presently holds the rank of associate professor. Previous to that, he taught at the University of Nebraska, Omaha. <laughs> You like that, Omaha? <laughs> Omaha. <laughs> he has a very interesting private practice in which he has been an economic research consultant to a number of groups. But probably the most interesting is his principalship in the stress time enterprises. For any of you undergoing abnormal stress, which I think is part of the process here at Bazooka. This is a very interesting private practice in which he will relieve you of all stresses. And he has been the president of this corporation since 1981. He is also the author of various journals, articles, films, and textbooks. And he has published the following books, The Quality of Life in America, Pollution, Poverty, Power, and Fear. Isn't that great? I mean, come on. I think he will talk a little bit about his involvement in the celestial tonight. He has written the guidebook to the Adler Planetarium and Astronomical Museum. That's the best I can do for star folks, so come on, let's have a little hand for that, huh? And he also, in 1961, wrote Selecting and Using Social and Economic Information in Urban Planning, which is a standard book used by the Mafia in Chicago for laying out their next particular neighborhoods for urban reinvestment, as we call it. Now, there's a rumor that filtered up to Chicago that some of you have a tendency to leave the lecture before it's over. <laughs> and we have the violin string quartet playing in the lobby, but we also have the violas up in the balcony. And the violas do a lot heavier number than the violin, so those of you folks in the balcony thinking you're going to get out of here early, you're wrong because of you always do a hell of a job on your body. Now, I think, 
I think it's very appropriate, and I would personally like to thank him for his humor, besides his unbelievable academic credentials and the fact that he actually consented to speak here on Halloween night. I present you Dr. David M. Salzman. We're now going to strangle this guy up here. Seriously, now. interesting to come to Muncie on Halloween as the architect's answer to Mr. T. <laughs> and I must say that uh, a funny thing happened to me on the way to the lecture tonight. <laughs> I encountered a good bit of the architectural faculty. <laughs> That's it. <clears throat> it's nice to come to a place where the architects hold forth, where you see graceful structures, well suited to the use to which they're put, the fine detailing, it goes so nicely with the cement blocks. I am happy to be here. I have never been made more welcome for any speaking engagement, and it's a testimony to what better living through chemistry can produce. <laughs> I hope, you know, I feel really somewhat informal for reasons that are hard to <laughs> So perhaps you'll forgive me if I take off my formal attire before my head gets too hot. <laughs> <laughs> when I was given a variety of dates when I could appear here I'm sorry, may I interrupt you for a moment? Are you so I apologize. I apologize. Somebody called and said there was an emergency. They would like to speak with Mr. B Jack Daniels. Now, I don't know if it's a Halloween joke or not. If, there, if there's somebody here by the name of Jack Daniels. I thought we talked to him before the lecture. <laughs> where's, the, where's the telephone? Come on, Jack. Call his roommate. I apologize. <laughs> Well, I wondered what they did out here in Muncie, and now I'm finding out. Somewhere, yes. <laughs> so when I had a chance to speak before a group on Halloween, the opportunity was just too great to pass up. These uh, holidays, especially these we take lightly, were for ancient people that in different places fairly serious events. Last time I gave this before a group of architectures, it was April Fool's Day. <laughs> These are uh, markings of the year, and uh, though some of us relate to the built environment as if we were in charge, in fact, we're not really in charge. We do our best to somehow accommodate our lives to the great rhythms of the world, which are playing out in such extraordinary beauty out of doors right now. I was really not at all sure how to proceed in this lecture, 
what to say, what the group would be like. Now I know. Uh, <laughs> First, I'd like to, before I get to my actual topic, I'd like to share just some pictures with you. There are about 10 photographs made, copied from a remarkable book by a man named Benoit Mandelbrot, who works for IBM. And the name of the book is really marvelous. It's called Fractals. I suggest we put this up. Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Can't you hear? You can hear. If you can't hear, come down here immediately. <laughs> That's right. I mean, you know, they didn't sit up in the balcony to hear. <laughs> Form follows function, right? <laughs> I'm not an architect. You have to learn some of these phrases if you're going to try to communicate. Ben Watt Mandel brought his book, Fractals, Form, Chance, and Dimension. He studies the periodicity of phenomena in the world and finds, not very remarkably, that many of the phenomena of the world are neither totally chaotic and random nor totally organized and predictable. So they're not just chaos and they're not just fascism. <laughs> Somewhere in between, the world makes its way with phenomena that balance these two possibilities. And in occasion after occasion, scene after scene, we see this beautiful balancing of these two polar opposites that are available for forms on Earth. He derives forms that replicate themselves at every scale, from the largest to the smallest. And when I first saw his book, it reminded me of a time, a ways back in the 60s, when I had spent a night at Gold Hill, Colorado, with some friends running around a mountaintop and frothing at the mouth a bit. <laughs> That's when my hair really looked like that. <laughs> And the sun came up, and uh, this country is all full of mining holes. The prospectors had dug out prospect holes all over the place and thrown these pieces of quartz and whatnot. And in my slightly altered state, I, uh, they seemed like jewels lying all over the floor, all over the ground. And one of the really strong impressions I had, which I carry with me to this time, so if you held up one of those crystals, you could see the form of the distant main front range of the mountains. It was ineffably the same form. And so I want to show you just ten illustrations I picked up more or less at random out of his book as a preface to what I'm here really to talk about. So if we can have my... One pathetic projector, I apologize. You know, if you're coming to talk to architects, you should really have several dissolving projectors and everything. Uh, I'm just falling way behind. Here are some of these patterns. And they replicate themselves through a mathematical progression, what he calls fractal dimensions, so that the form of each tiny part is the same as the form of the entire large-scale structure. Just enjoy with me, if you can, some of these structures. We can all say, oh, I recognize that, I've seen that today, or all the time. Throughout the world, it's the same story. Look at this. This landscape at the top is generated entirely by a computer using the kind of balanced relationship, his 1 over F relationship, that we've seen exhibited in the other pieces. And then certain areas were left blank 
and we'd all be hard-pressed to say that that was not a photograph of an actual mountain landscape with snow fields. Now there's a planet, I'm sure I've seen it somewhere. The continents look all very familiar. The oceans look very familiar as well. Of course, it doesn't exist anywhere. It's a set of continents built on this same principle that we've been exploring for a few minutes and sharing. This is nothing but a series of white dots on black paper. And yet, it contains in it the mystery and the suggestion of deep space. I'm going to, in a manner that, well, should, I don't know whether I can characterize it as art, it sure as the devil isn't science, share with you in a way that's not often done in my part of academics, my actual intuitive process by which I consider the changes and the dynamics of urban form. You know, in academics, it's really not kosher to say where you got the idea. It usually comes out with all of the data and the analysis and so forth. And the idea seems to come sort of last after you study all this stuff, but we all know that that's really backwards of the truth. Still, it's not very fashionable to lead with your chin, with your heart in this way. So since we have such an amenable group and well lubricated, I thought we would take this plunge and try it this way. Now I'm going to read a paper for you that I've written called Cities and Stars, Energy and Urban Form, with many digressions. And when I'm done, I'd be very glad to share your questions and discussion with everyone if you have any energy left for it at that time. It is my intention in this short paper to assess some changes in the form of cities which may occur if energy problems of the recent past continue or increase in the future. Such problems may include restrictions in supply and possibilities for massive increases in cost for all forms of energy derived from fossil fuels. A complicating factor for this analysis arises because not all forms of energy which affect cities arise from the physical world. Human imagination and invention also work to create urban form. Because of the resulting complexities, there is at present no well-founded, purely scientific method of grappling with these problems. Since this is the case, my pathway in this speculative endeavor will be metaphoric. I will attempt to carry discussion beyond the limits which at present circumscribe consideration of this topic by using a comparative and poetic approach. I will draw upon parallels noted during many years of study of both astronomy and urban geography. I first glimpsed the unlikely parallels between cities and stars through considerations of a paper by the renowned urban geographer Charles C. Colby. In this paper, Colby asserted that the form of a city is at any time generated with the play of complementary, opposing, centrifugal and centripetal forces. He emphasized the dynamic nature of this interplay by insisting that these forces are continually in conflict. This description exactly parallels the situation for stars in which size and density derive from a dynamic balance between opposing complementary forces of outpressing radiation and in-crushing gravity. I became curious as to how far such a parallel between cities and stars might go, and the results were so interesting to me that I wish to share them with you. These considerations also led me to seek generalizing principles which affect not just cities and stars, but all forms in space. <clears throat> it is clear that all things in space of whatever origin and kind are required by spatial dictates to assume certain limited forms. These forms in turn grow and change in space 
with reference to the flow of energy through their structures. Perhaps you remember the first whole earth catalog with the kind of a quotation uh, uh, on the cover that said, the flow of energy through a form acts to organize the form. This is precisely what I mean. This is the work that Ilya Prigogine won a Nobel Prize for, his understanding of organizing principles based on energy flow for very diverse systems. Indeed, these structures themselves, the offsprings of space, change the space within their vicinity. So that there's an interplay between the material forms in space and the space itself. This interplay has been noted on the human level by psychologists, geographers, proxemicists, and architects. On the astronomical scale, the parallel case is stated by astrophysicists when they write, and I quote, from a 1,700-page book published by Freeman called Gravitation by Meisner, Wheeler, and Thorne, they write, Space acts on matter, telling it how to move. In turn, matter reacts back on space, telling it how to curve. Consequently, concentrations of matter which form in space act as organizing centers for the space surrounding them. Within astronomical systems, for instance, many types and levels of such organizing centers may be discerned, from the atom to the star to the metagalaxy. Within human systems, such organizing centers also present a hierarchy of sizes which key to different levels of spatial organization. Hence, we find terms such as hamlet, city, and megalopolis. But just as spatial dictates inform the basic structure of such organizing centers, so does the flow of energy through such centers produce analogous changes in their form and density, irrespective of their origins or composition. An addition of energy to a system causes that system to expand, while a reduction of energy in a system causes it to contract. The architect Peter Stevens underscores this idea when he writes, the specific mechanism that brings pattern or form into being is not as important to its overall appearance as how its constituent parts relate in space. If the parts are free to adjust and find equilibrium, they arrange themselves in a configuration of minimum energy. One might think that human systems are exceptions to these general rules, since human creativity and choice are critical elements of ongoing change. But whatever human invention produces, whatever human choices are made, and whatever forms develop as a result, such forms must still be fit, that is, they must still fit into the larger world ecologically, and they too must follow the parameters dictated by the rules of space. Thus, when the energy necessary for the support of the extensive Byzantine empire was reduced by the cutting of supply lines, the empire shrunk little by little from its extended state until it was reduced to the confines of the city of Constantinople. Such observations raise a question. Is the human condition determined by the environment? Or does human thought and action so modify the environment that the equation reads the other way around? The answer to this conundrum would seem to be that within an environmental system where survival of the organism is biologically possible, the question of determinism is moot, that is, it is clear that organism environment relations are reflexive. The determinism works, works both, all ways. Occupation of the earth is allowed by the interface between human imaginings and the potentialities of the world. But for all that, where human systems are not fit, they too fail. 
we turn now to our metaphoric study of cities and stars. First, we will present a sample of the very large number of parallels between stellar and urban forms. Next, we will consider the evolution of stars as their production of energy changes. Lastly, we will utilize the fruits of our comparisons to suggest possibilities for the evolution of urban forms under severe energy crisis. Star clusters, city groups. Stars tend to form in clusters out of a cloud of dust and gas at once rarefied and turbulent. This turbulence gives rise to local rarefactions and compressions. Where the gas is compressed, gravitational interactions bind some gas particles to, for, to others to form clumps, the germs for nascent stars. Such stars are usually formed in clusters with a very few large stars and many smaller stars. Clearly, there's a parallel there, which I just mean to suggest by this graph. Cities, too, form out of such a turbulent flow, and we'll, I'll read on, but clearly there are few very large cities and many more urban... <laughs> Poltergeists. Uh, forms as you get to smaller settlement types. An Earth landscape is itself a complex surface of potentialities and, oh, by the way, I probably should tell you what this is. This is a so-called nebula in the constellation of Serpens, right in the path of the Milky Way. Here we see immense clouds of dust and gas condensing out to form stars, and these stars are forming in families we get the sense, though to be sure some of it is illusionary, of the few large bright stars and the plethora of many fainter, smaller stars. This is a stellar nursery. An Earth landscape is itself a complex surface of potentialities and possibilities. Out of the turbulent interplay of these potentialities, cities may form where favorable conditions bring people together. Germs of settlement occur where roads cross or trails meet. Such sites may subsequently develop as centers of settlement. Cities like stars are often formed in groups with a few relatives. Conditions bring people together. Germs of settlement occur where roads cross or trails meet. Such sites may subsequently develop as centers of settlement. Cities like stars are often formed in groups with a few relatively large centers and many smaller ones. You know, you saw that picture earlier from the book on fractals. I can't go all the way back through the slides to show it to you, but it didn't look very different from this picture. And how remarkably this picture, remarkably this picture describes the resulting geographical landscape with a set of nested regions of dominance focused on centers of differing size. As with stars, Dense clouds of population produce thick clusters of centers, while thin clouds produce fewer and smaller organizing centers. This is the Pleiades cluster, a young star cluster in the constellation of Taurus. It can't be more than about 60 million years old, and these baby stars are still wrapped in the cocoon of the nebula out of which they were formed. Here is a suggestive diagram by the great German astronomer, physicist, C.F. von Weizsäcker, where he proposes a model for the formation of a solar system with eddies of various size, producing condensations of various sizes in a kind of hierarchical arrangement. This is a map of a section of southern Germany where central place studies and central place theory was derived. And here we find the form rep replicated, just like those fractal diagrams, with a nested hierarchy of centers 
The larger centers commanding large amounts of space, the smaller centers nested within those regions of dominance and commanding smaller sections of space. Interaction. Cities born in clusters, like stars, interact strongly with each other. Stars interact by means of particle exchanges and produce gravitational and magnetic fields. Cities relate by means of similar particle exchanges, which produce the well-known phenomena of the urban field. Urban particle exchange carry such names as communication, freight, immigration, traffic, and flows of money and credit. Most of these phenomena in, uh, uh, exhibit distance decay and thus follow laws similar to gravitational interactions between stars. Please excuse me if I define for you a term that may be well known to you. I'm not uh, an architect and I'm not quite sure whether such terms as distance decay are in your lexicon. Distance decay relates to some process or phenomenon that reduces as distance increases. Okay? Gravity. There is a strong parallel between astronomical gravitation and the gravity-like formulations which apply to cities, although it is clear that the gravity we perceive in the interaction patterns between and within cities is not a direct analog to astronomical gravity. Yet the parallel is so compelling that geographers are forced to considerable circumlocution in order to, to describe the difference. The geographer Peter Haggett comments, Newton's laws of gravitation have been found to throw light on geographers' understanding of the way in which flows occur between cities. This does not mean that you and I are swept along between cities like molecules in an urban gravitational field. It does signify that the trillions of telephone messages, billions of freight car journeys, or millions of aircraft movements that link the world's galaxy of settlements show a tendency, taken as a whole, to move in a way not unlike Newton's physical laws would predict. Very embarrassing. I can feel his embarrassment at having to admit that this physical law fits the actual situation so remarkably. And I have illustrated for you the basic formula. On the left is Newton's gravitational formula, where the gravitational constant is related to directly, proportionately to the masses involved and inversely proportional to the square of the distance separating them. On the right is the interaction formula. That formula says that the expected interaction between any two urban places is directly proportional to their populations and inversely proportional to the distance that separates them. Why not distance squared? Because in astronomical space, we're talking about three space. And in this other case, though we do have airplanes and so forth, basically the space we're talking about is two-dimensional. It's very interesting to see how many of the fundamental laws of astronomy are, are really expressions of the basic geometry. We'll talk about that more in a moment. And I hope I'm not putting you to sleep with this. I'll, for, I'll move forward more quickly. But gravity and other phenomena which vary inversely with the square of the distance really reflect the character of space itself. Quote from a, an astronomer named Bash. The inverse square law is basically an effect of geometry. In the astronomical sense, gravity, quote, is the only one of the known forces which may be built up through the addition of mass. Significantly, larger populations produce the same addi additive effect for in interactions described by urban gravitation. Once again, the dictates arising from the interplay of mass and space are mirrored in both astronomical and urban space. Of course, we must recognize that even in the astronomical case, the gravitational effect is absolutely independent of the composition of a mass. I don't know, we all know these things. We learned them in elementary school, and without questioning them, we accept them for truth. But that's some truth that really bears reflection, because it simply doesn't matter 
if a star is made of hydrogen gas, nickel iron, or green cheese. All that matters is that there be a certain mass and the gravitational effects will be as described and the composition doesn't mean a damn thing. Energy generation and the emergence of form. We have already noted that centers of mass of whatever kind deform or curve the space around them. All roads lead to Rome. Cities and stars thus organize the space and resources available to them. At the centers of both cities and stars, transactions and transformations of energy work through appropriate mechanisms to beget associated physical phenomena which are intimately related to the availability, physical cost, and means of distribution of energy. In turn, the amount of energy so developed, channeled, and released feeds back through the system and results in changes in the size and density of the organizing center itself. The energy related to urban systems is greater than merely the amount of physical energy from fossil fuels and the like. It also includes the energy which arises from human imagination and creativity, but the propinquity afforded by high density urban living has itself been instrumental in releasing such energies. The mix of human imagination and physical energy is manipulated in urban centers through abstract symbolic means of investment, disinvestment, definition, and redefinition. The manipulation of such symbols redefines the world and in so doing, produces gains in conceptual utility for ideas, resources, products, and processes. Thus, the transmutation of elements which lies at the heart of energy-generating processes in stars has its counterpart in the abstract activities of investors, politicians, and entrepreneurs bolstered by intellectual and other creative and professional groups. Cities and stars are thus seen to exhibit many parallels and coincidences in terms of their formation, the fields to which they give rise, the gravitational character of their interactions, and even in terms of their structures, particle spacings, and the way in which energy mediated by transformations in the center is channeled into physical form. Table 1 contains many of the most salient of such comparisons. However, before concluding this section of the discussion, I wish to emphasize once again that structure in both cities and stars results from a dynamic conflict and balancing of forces, with many cyclic movements and adjustments. Structure, then, is not the constraining geometry of a static form, it is the incessant beat of underlying rhythms. We shall now relate these underlying rhythms to changes in available energy and observe changes in the size and density of cities and stars as the supply of energy changes. Energy and, uh -huh, well, sorry about that. I thought I had them all right side up. I do, but it's backward. Doesn't matter. You don't need to read that anyhow. Energy in stellar form. First, we must note that stable stars exist because of a delicately tuned balance between radiation, which tries to tear the star apart, and gravity, which tries to squeeze the star into nothingness. Variations in the energy output of the star must result in changes in the size and density of the star to reattain a balance with gravity. If, for instance, the energy production of a star falls, the star must shrink and increase in density until its central temperatures and pressures again balance the ever-present gravitational force. On the other hand, if the energy production of a star increases, its size must increase and its density must decrease to radiate energy fast enough to establish a new balance, a new minimum energy configuration. Next, it is of interest to understand the manner in which stars generate additional energy. Next, it is of interest to understand the manner in which stars generate additional energy. As a typical star ages, it exhausts the hydrogen fuel in its central core. Gradually, the center of the star fills with helium ash. Temperatures in the core are too low to fuse helium into heavier elements. As a result, the degenerate material in the core can no longer support the weight of the outer layers of the star, and so the core collapses. 
The collapse of the core of the star heats the core to a temperature where helium can fuse into heavier elements. However, the atomic processes involving helium burn much hotter than the hydrogen reactions. The result is a very rapid increase in the energy production of the star. As noted before, the star must then suddenly expand in order to radiate the vastly increased energy output. These bloated stars have relatively cool red surfaces and so are known as red giant stars. They are characterized by enormous size, low density, mass loss to the surrounding space, and a very rapid consumption of energy. After the star becomes a red giant, the helium burning core gradually expands and the energy production diminishes. As a result of the decreased energy production, the uh, outer envelope of the star collapses. Once again, a balance between radiation and gravity may be restored. But if the star is very large and massive, it may, after successive expansions and contractions, collapse into a new state in which the outer layers of the stars are blown away by violent supernova explosion, and the remaining mass of the star is compressed into an ultra-high-density state. The resulting star is called a neutron star. Here's a picture of a star to which this happened. It was seen on Earth about a thousand years ago. Uh, it happened quite a bit before that, since this is some distance away. This is the so-called Crab Nebula in the constellation of Taurus. When a star loses half or 60% of its mass through one of these violent explosions, you see it makes quite a mess out of the surrounding space. In the heart of that cloud of dust and gas, there's a star that is at incredible densities. It has the densities of a star, say, with the, with the mass of the sun, packed into a volume of perhaps 10 miles. So it's really packed together. It may also be possible under special conditions for the core of the star to be compressed to a point where neither radiation nor any other force can balance gravity. Under this condition, the star collapses out of the universe and into a so-called black hole. In such a case, only the mass, electrical charge, and angular momentum of the original star continue to play a part in the universe, rather like a grin on the Cheshire cat in Alice in Wonderland. Energy and urban form. Since the end of the Second World War, cities in the United States have exploded outward, creating sprawling, low-density urban regions. Such expanded urban forms were made possible and necessary by increasing populations and income levels, and especially by the availability of vast floods of cheap energy in the form of petroleum products and electricity. At the same time cities were expanding, city cores were shrinking in population, jobs, and resources. The explosive expansion of the urban region was thus accompanied by a shrinking of the urban core. Such sprawling red giant urban regions are characterized by great size, low density, loss of population into exurban areas, and a requirement for and consumption of huge amounts of energy. The greatly increased expenditure of energy per capita is facilitated by the greatly enlarged scale of the urban forms created, by diseconomies of small scale in the provision of suburban services, <clears throat> pardon me, and by the increased energy requirements for heating and cooling detached single-family uh, suburban homes, and finally, by the universal requirement for the use of automobiles to tie together the bloated urban form. This drawing is just suggestive. If we take one of the simplest of built forms, I'm not talking about a sphere or an egg, but rather a cube, it loses energy to its surroundings on six spaces. Obviously, if you can produce multi-family multi units, shared walls, allow some of that energy loss to be minimized, compensated, shared. And so in general, at least as far as I can tell, in talking with architects and engineers in Chicago, something like 11 to 17 percent can be saved on heating costs in multifamily rather than single-family detached structures, and a great deal more than that, perhaps over 50 percent, in cooling, since the technology of cooling is so much less well uh, advanced than the technology of heating. Uh, <clears throat> I have a few maps here that are kind of curious. We hear, and it is indeed a fact, for instance, that in Chicago there are now more jobs in the suburban ring than there are in the city itself. Accordingly, I would guess that 
the length of the journey to work would increase outward from the city center to a certain place, and then it would decrease again due to the location of nearby jobs. Well, that's the speculation. I don't know whether it's in focus or whether I can focus it from here. I'm squeezing this little doodad, but it's not doing very much. Thank you very much. Yeah, okay. Here's, in fact, the situation. Average work trip distances, and this is not speculation. This is as a result of research by transportation people. The farther you go from the center of the city, the longer, on the average, the journey to work. They may work in the suburbs and live in the suburbs, but they live in this suburb and they work in that suburb, and it's the whole game, uh, the whole game is on. In fact, this map is not significantly different from one that you would find if all the jobs were concentrated in the center. Here's the average energy consumed for work trips. Again, virtually the same pattern, increasing radially outward from the urban core. Look at this map, a percentage of people without autos. No surprise, people in the middle of the city need automobiles much less, and many don't have them. And that's true for the various little suburban centers as well. And of course, we have the flip side of this, and that's the map of people with two or more autos. And people I know have looked at this, and they say, well, that's just a map of increasing wealth. It may be so. But you cannot exist out there in those suburban areas unless you have an automobile. And so there is a sense of enforcement due to the spatial arrangement and structure of the urban region. Maybe that means you don't live out there if you can't afford to do it. Maybe it means that's where your money goes if you live out there rather than someplace else. <clears throat> Data from the 1980 census population indicate that pr these processes still obtain with continued flight of jobs and population from city cores to suburban and exurban areas and with principal urban growth confined to the so-called Sun Belt areas of the South and West. But while these irrefutable figures called uh, seem to announce the virtual death of many older cities, city cores across the United States are experiencing an amazing revival of interest. Downtown construction in many cities is booming. An adaptive reuse of older, derelict, or obsolete structures has become a nationwide phenomenon. Central business district space is expanding both laterally and vertically, and there may also be seen a small but important movement of some affluent white middle class groups back into central cities. This is a graph of commercial office space construction in Chicago from the year of the Great Chicago Fire, 1871, to eight, 19, uh, well, about 1977, so it's a few years out of date. The line, the dashed line at the upper right has continued, and it's only in this next year that as little as two million square feet of central area commercial space is being added. Chicago has experienced one of the most dramatic series of growth centers of any urban area in the United States. And you see that even in the time of suburbanization and so forth, this growth in the center has been continuing. Uh, there are some of the buildings of the, that are developed on the air rights over the Illinois Central Railroad freight yards right downtown. On the left is one of the Illinois Center buildings, the development of metropolitan structures and the largest planned central city development in the United States. Uh, uh, that is a multi-use development. What you see there is an office building. Next to it is two uh, towers of Hyatt Hotel. Beyond that are mixed commercial and residential space. Tower, towering over them all in the background is one of the tallest buildings in the world, the Standard Oil Building. <clears throat> uh, you begin to find a certain interest in publications of all sorts. Modernization, a special issue. What turned this vintage building into such a hot property? Well, you have all seen this kind of thing, I'm sure. What interests me especially about this particular building is that it is in the what you might call the downtown area of that least downtown of all cities, Los Angeles, even there. <clears throat> in the case of New York, 
the revitalization of the central core is so pronounced that scholars describing the sorry state of contemporary cities are forced to cite New York as an exceptional case in which a donut of urban decay surrounds an active, viable, rejuvenating core area. This image is identical to a picture of a star in which core collapse allows new energy to be extracted from the ashes in its center. Let's look at a few more pictures from Chicago. You know, as I was telling my friends who met me earlier today, I had intended to come in here this evening with a bunch of new pictures that right up to date. There are so many fantastic buildings that have just been completed and are under construction in Chicago. And I ran around and I took all the pictures and I rushed to the film place where they would uh, be uh, developed. And I was told that they would be, the last pickup was at two and it was five minutes of two, but the guy was gone already. So the next morning I went to a film lab and I was their last customer. I got in under the wire and I realized I had Kodachrome film rather than Ektachrome film, and so I'll have it tomorrow if you want to wait. Uh, <clears throat> this is a new apartment building, rental. It's charming, they advertise it as being rental, not, not going condominium, not uh, realizing in terms of the public that that's the basis on which they got their loan from the government that it not be converted. That's Marshall Field who built this uh, tower. And uh, it has a McDonald's down in the base. The Chicago River is between us and the base of that building. On the right is the famed Wrigley Building. It's right downtown. We begin to see evidence of this changing of viewpoint in the most diverse places. Religious publications, general publications, the comeback of downtown. America falls in love with its cities again. The black curve <clears throat> represents an approximation of what geographers and urban economists and many others have noted for years. Our cities are peculiar. Their population density curves look like a volcano in cross-section. They have a peak fairly close to the city center and then they tail off at some appropriate curve. Maybe not quite so steep as that after automobiles spread the city out. However, in the middle there's virtually nobody. That's changing very rapidly. The apartment building I just showed you you know, brings hundreds of people to live right down in ground zero in the city center. And so the red curve is my suggestion for what we're going to be seeing in most large cities before long, a resurgence of round-the-clock settlement in the old central business district. <clears throat> just a reminder. In stars, after the energy crisis in which the core collapses and the outside spreads out, the core increases and the outside begins to fall together. And uh, I suggest that that's what we're perhaps seeing now. At the same time, there is considerable evidence for core rejuvenation and expansion of some central business districts. There are concomitant indications that a weakening economy, this was written a little while ago, inflation and high interest rates are combining to produce, quote, the biggest but least recognized slump in the real prices of homes since World War II. That's about two years old from the World Wall Street Journal. Indeed, some of the areas may have seen the hottest markets for home sales are those which have been the hardest hit. The housing market has virtually collapsed in Vancouver, Canada. Condominium prices are dropping in Hawaii. And when the financing terms of recent deals are carefully examined, single-family homes in California are falling in price. We may be seeing the first actual decline in home prices since the Depression. That's a direct quote from the Wall Street Journal. Now, you know, I'm sure, that since interest rates came down, home sales went up. But the minute interest rates have climbed back up a little bit, as they have, home sales have once again dropped. So I don't think we're talking about something that is completely altered. In recent years, most of the newest housing construction and the fastest price run-up has occurred in suburban developments. So it is there that the greatest risk may be incurred in the purchase of homes with heavily inflated prices. If such homes fail to appreciate greatly in value, quote, many thousands of buyers won't be able to afford refinancing their notes. Again, the Wall Street Journal. Material rearrangement. Just as city core collapse was accompanied by rapid radial expansion, so now core expansion is coupled to falling prices in suburban areas and the beginnings of a return to the city by some groups of the white middle class. In stars, expansion and contractions are accompanied by a rearrangement of material, with the heaviest elements moving toward the center, while lighter, more volatile elements either move toward the perimeter or are forcibly ejected into the surrounding space. <clears throat> 
If we see wealthy segments of the population as heavy elements, and the poor as more volatile, lighter elements, then the comparison between cities and stars suggests that the poor will be displaced outward to the suburbs and beyond by the actions of those with enough wealth to move toward the most efficient central locations where local transportation costs are minimized and commercial interaction and cultural and recreational opportunities are enhanced. It should be emphasized that as welfare payments are cut back, as public transportation is reduced, as public schools founder due to inadequate financing, Poor populations will find less and less reasons to remain in the city core, especially when blue-collar jobs are either in the suburbs or in rapidly growing sunbelt cities. If such rearrangement of groups, let me see here. Let me show you some of this. <clears throat> Pictures taken over the last few years in Chicago. This is right off of my campus, that tall building in the background is the uh, administration building. There was a famed French geographer named Jean Brun who said, what's of interest to the geographers, what's written on the landscape? And there we have something written on the landscape, the administration building. If you look at it carefully, you'll notice that it's a lot bigger at the top than it is at the bottom. <clears throat> Very subtle, beautiful confirmations. Suburban living within the city, this project by now completely built and new ones going on. Uh, some of these publications you may already have seen yourselves. Old houses, schools, factory are ripe for recycling profits. Buildings like this in Chicago and neighborhoods that are acceptable uh, have been going for very fancy prices. And I'm sure you can't have gone very far in your architectural study without just seeing an enormous amount of interest in retrofitting, rehabilitating such structures. Custom Victorian condominiums. This is Wicker Park. Very often, older historical areas of the city have gotten a lot of investor attention. That's certainly true in Chicago, where mausoleums like this uh, sit around in selected places. <clears throat> Here's a police station on Halstead Street. Uh, it doesn't look like a police station anymore. This is Walter Netsch's house <laughs> in Old Town an area of the city that was an area of old German settlement and was rehabilitated by private capital entirely. And was that when that occurred 20 years or so ago, I think it was the first example in the country of such private re redevelopment in central cities. <clears throat> These buildings on the right are now all rehab. The, the one on the farthest right is just a fantastic little industrial space cut up into beautiful large condominiums, a huge elevator off to the side, off street parking, and a fabulous penthouse on top, fetching very fancy prices in an area which five years ago I think many of you would have agreed was a, nearly a free fire zone in terms of the urban populations. Clapboard houses snuggled together on Chicago's north side with buildings behind them, another two or three story building in the back lot. You cannot believe the density and intensity of that rehabilitation that's occurring there. Very often veterans return from the Vietnam War with little capital and a lot of energy and put sweat equity into these things and they built according to code and they built around the code and they built underneath the code. And they're living in these things. They get them habitable, live in them, and continue the rehabilitation process. And before you know it, these guys with very little money have got several buildings, and they're expanding. And of course, they're working within the framework of the existing resources. <clears throat> a bank advertisement. You see, our interest is in this community. That's quite a change from a few years ago. This little building is on Armitage Avenue in Mohawk in Chicago. It was about four blocks south of the northern limit burned by the fire in 1871. And this building antedates the fire. Such a charming old building, I always thought. And when they put up the brick wall, I said, well, oh, that's pretty clever and that's good. It kind of creates a separation, a little park-like space in this vacant lot next door to the south. But uh, unfortunately, Visions of sugar plums in the form of lots of cash dance before the owners of this place and now that southern lot that gave all that light and graciousness to this building has been filled up by four-story condominiums and this house has been condominiumized and uh, sold. 
looking at the loop from the northwest, this picture is a few years old, even now we would see many new buildings emerging. The sense of energy and construction in toward the central loop is really awe-inspiring. If you're gone for two weeks and then you drive down a street, it's uh, an amazing amount of change. <clears throat> Oh, yes. Okay. Let's see where I am. If such rearrangement of groups within the population occurs, the supernova would rapidly expel the poor, while wealthier groups would cluster densely in or near the city center. United States cities would then repeat the pattern seen in most other nations, that of the rich living near the middle of the city, while those poorer and poorer live farther and farther from the powerful center of organization. Expensive residences. As such groups discover and move into and begin to renovate city neighborhoods, they are joined by young singles and childless couples who work downtown. These are followed by a wave of new eating places, watering holes, and theaters and fashionable boutiques which cater to such trade. As the areas become quieter and more organized, the main body of the middle class begins to appear, especially those who can afford private schools for their children. This is the cover of Chicago Magazine a few years ago. Renewing a neighborhood, who makes out, who gets hurt. Here the old person with her bird cage and her shopping bag is on her way to wherever. The young swish fun fur, sign print, upward mobile, childless, maybe married couple, goes in. This is a supposition or hypothetical diagram Perhaps some of you have seen Marcel Marceau act out the seven ages of man, where he starts all curled up like a fetus and gradually unwinds to full stature. And as he does so, he moves more and more wildly and grandly through the space. And then as he ages, he begins to shrink back and ends where he began. This is a model of that same process, with the middle age having the greatest space hunger and demand, and the old and the young being less so. Of course, we have a population that is rapidly aging, and so we would expect that the impetus among those who can afford it who are older would be to a, the city center where they don't have to move so far. At the same time, there's a concomitant that those who can't afford it, the, the poor and old, will be forced into suburban locations where they're going to have considerable difficulties. Saturday Review again. New laws have made it more and more difficult to prevent minority groups and the poor from entering suburbs. I collaborated with the Chicago Urban League a couple of years ago on the Regional Housing Mobility Program, which brought subsidized individuals, minority groups principally, and placed them in the suburban ring. I could hardly believe it since it seemed to me so much the harbinger of what I believe is going to occur anyway. This fascinating picture occurred on the cover of Dollars and Cents, a black financial publication in Chicago, and shows Dempsey Travis, a very astute and rich black realtor, uh, director of the Sears Bank and so forth, looking at the situation. On the left, 1900, the blacks coming by wagon train and whatnot from the south to jobs in the central city. The year 2000, the blacks steaming out to suburbia while very quietly on the far right, the white populations are tiptoeing back. <clears throat> Whoops, <laughs> maybe that means it's the end, I don't know. <clears throat> well, I do expect to see the cities pull in to continue to lose population as they have in the last census and to become much more compressed spatially. Maybe we have the lights and I'll finish it off without these slides and maybe we can wake everybody up, myself included. Okay. Alternative viewpoints. Here let us depart briefly from our considerations of parallels between cities and stars. 
to consider the possibility that increasingly automated manufacturing processes and the use of computer terminals will transfer the workplace to the home and will result not in concentrated but in evenly spread settlement. In this vision, the present organization and concentration of populations in urban centers would give way either to a multitude of small settlements or an evenly distributed population. Let us examine this notion from a standpoint of civil engineering. There are two especially crucial and troublesome requirements for human occupants of the earth. First, that an adequate supply of fresh water be available. And second, that there must be some suitable method for human waste disposal. In the event of a uniformly spread human population, either the dispersed populations would have to be provided with complete waste recycling systems, or within a few days, everyone would be drinking water polluted by the waste generated by their surrounding neighbors. The alternative of creating waste treatment districts seems unreasonable in terms of the gigantic costs which would be incurred, and because such systems are already in place in major cities. We conclude, therefore, that despite other technological improvements, uniformly scattered settlement is unlikely at best and probably impossible in any case. Of course, social considerations may ultimately be just as important to the healthy functioning of the human organism as the civil engineering requirements just mentioned. But in any case, the various considerations presented here would seem to rule out this form of settlement. A multitude of small towns would certainly appear more possible from both technical and social points of view. But of course, life in such settlements is much more strictured than the relatively free and autonomous life available in cities. For that matter, the reduced density of human contacts may har hamper human creativity and imagination if populations spend their entire lives in small towns. For these reasons, such a pattern of settlement with its diseconomies of small scale also seem unlikely. Of course, neither of the settlement forms so far considered has taken into account the necessity of for junction points and major routes for the concentration, break of bulk, and distribution of necessary goods and services. From the foregoing considerations and others, we conclude that even under conditions of energy crisis, limited resources, and the rise of automation and computer-assisted employment, that the propinquity and focusing of human energy provided by urban settlements will continue to provide social and cultural amenities as well as economies of scale and agglomerative economies which will make cities the most efficient settlement type available. Will such cities be located primarily in the Sun Belt? Clearly, if solar power is developed and efficiently utilized, great savings in the general use of energy could be affected if a majority of the population lived where social, uh, solar energy was especially effective. Sun belt. But solar energy is useful over much of the United States, and unfortunately, large portions of the Sun Belt are in regions of extremely limited supplies of potable water. For this reason above any other, I conclude that the explosive growth of sunbelt cities, especially in the southwest, is reaching a climax. Such settlements would seem then to represent more truly the end of the profligate past, when energy supplies and other resources seemed almost infinite, than the harbinger of future development. I suspect that since 95% of the freshwater resources of the United States are stored in the Great Lakes, eventually this important fact will serve to assure continuing large urban populations in the Great Lakes region. If this be so, then the older cities of the upper Middle West will once again thrive. Yet current st statistics may give one pause. Information on St. Louis, for instance, describes a vacancy rate in that city of around 30%. But let us imagine that every building in the old river city was literally removed from the face of the earth. Perhaps this would represent the urban form of a stellar black hole. What would be left in such a case? Simply this. Where the former city stood, the spatial organization developed reflexively between the city and the environment would still exist. Many roads, routes, rails, and trails would still cross where the city had been. It would thus seem, even if vacant, an excellent location for some service establishment, such as a lemonade stand, filling station, or perhaps a warehouse or sales and distribution center. So the mass of the former cities curving and organizing the space would remain even after all buildings were, were removed. The grin of the Cheshire Cat would continue to inform the space in the vicinity of the former city. Economy becomes geometry. 
The foregoing material suggests that American cities would become less populous, more compact in form, and higher in density under conditions of energy crisis. It may be that as urban regions collapse to more er energy efficient forms, expelled populations will themselves condense into compact high density centers, forming multiple nodes surrounding the main center. Multinodal urban forms are already appearing. But whether the emerging forms are multinodal or single-centered, they will, by their compact structure and high density, provide the propinquity and scale and agglomerative economies available only in concentrated settlement forms. These attributes will continue to be of critical importance. Indeed, their importance will become greater as energy efficiency assumes greater importance. The viewpoint we have taken suggests that most, most cities will sustain a rebirth and that this regeneration will arise principally from the urgent requirements of energy as population and forms of settlement seek minimum energy con configurations. Our analysis has thus allowed us to consider the general character of systems in space, the earth in a grain of sand, and eternity in an hour. But we may not forget the concomitant alterations of the human condition, the quality of life which will necessarily, necessarily accompany major changes in the physical form of cities. Architects have long been aware of the process by which form follows from function, but the reverse is equally true. That is, functions are generated from form. If the future holds severe energy limitations and crises, then urban forms, to the extent they are free to adjust, will become minimum energy forms. If our analysis holds any truth, the plight of the urban poor could become extreme as they become unable to share in the efficiencies of the city and are expelled to less efficient and more costly demeans in distant suburban or exurban locations. Surely as we look forward toward the future, we must strive to alleviate the possibility of such chaos and despair. But in our planning, success will only come if we are sensitive to the, special, uh, to the spatial limits which circumscribe all forms, to the human adjustments which will be necessary aspects of energy efficient forms, and to the unlimited possibilities of the human spirit. These considerations will help us to succeed, but we must realize that if we fail our task, it is not in our stars, but in ourselves that we are underlings. Thank you. Well, it's a terrible thing to read a paper, especially a short one. <laughs> it gets longer as you read it in a hot room after dinner. I was practically putting myself to sleep when I'm burning with the excitement of all of this. Have any of you any questions for me or comments? Yes. Well, you said at the beginning of the lecture that uh, these center points or objects control the, organize the space around them. Is there any such thing as unorganized space? Or is this just That's, the question is, is, we were talking about organizing centers of space, and this question was, are there, is there any unorganized space? And I think I have to say no that space is a set of relationships. You can't look at it as something you can cut out a chunk of and move to somewhere. It exists only as relationships. And that's why when you have air rights development, for instance, you are redefining space. You're creating space by sets of relationships. OK, now what after that? Uh, that was it. That was it. Well, OK. <laughs> Other questions, anything? Yes. What type of strategy would you recommend bringing this theoretical thinking forward for uh, urban planning? Uh, the question was, what sort of strategy would I suggest? And the strategy that I suggest is to stop putting our money into situations which are ever more costly to build more and more extended urban forms with more and more extended street systems, uh, electric systems, phone systems, sewer and potable water systems is monstrously expensive in a time of economic retrenchment. It's more than of passing interest that today the cost of repairing the putting the needed repairs on the bridges of the interstate highway system will cost more than the interstate highway system caught, which makes possible this kind of extended business. I also would stop, uh, you know, uh, this hue and cry, the, the wailing over the sorry plight of the central city. I would build structures, and I would try to build structures in, in the central city that allowed um, for economic diversity. The new, the new st uh, stratification in the city is clearly not going to be black and white. It's going to be bucks and no bucks. 
Salt and pepper is already achieved in the most expensive apartments in downtown Chicago. The color that counts is green. Anything else? Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.